The Grey King, Day 8. Will rolled more slowly than he had expected. The awkward shape of the heart pressed against his chest, cut into his bruised arm, and hurt so much that soon he could scarcely keep from dropping it. He stopped often and changed his position. There were other reasons for pausing, too, for the ferocity of malvescence building up in the valley now thrust at him like a great hand, pushing him away, threatening to clutch him in the giant fingers and crush him into nothingness. Doggedly, Will rode on, first the cottage, then the lake, in the discordant chaos, trying to force him back, only the simplest thoughts and images could survive, keep their shape. First the cottage, then the lake. He found himself saying it under his breath. Those were the two tasks for the harp that, above all else, he must make sure we were carried out in these next two or three hours. The enchanted music must release Penn from the grip of the wearstone in the cottage, so that he would escape Caradog Pritchard's gun. That was a simple matter. But then, more important than anything in the world, the music must wake the sleepers of the pleasant lake, the creatures who slept their timeless sleep beside Tal Wylin, whoever and whatever those creatures might be. For if a lord of the dark such as the great king could gain so astonishing a power as that now filling this valley, after centuries of murmuring sleep beneath his mountain, then indeed the dark was rising in its whole power, increasing like a vast cloud threatening to engulf the whole world. At last he came to the cottage and found it empty. Will stood in the, in the bare stone walled room, baffled and anxious. How could Penn have escaped the power of the Wearstone? Where was Bran? Had Caradoc Pritchard come hunting with aid from the great, great king and carried them both off? Impossible. Caradoc Pritchard was an unwitting servant, knowing nothing of his own links with the great king. He was a man only, with the instincts of a man, the worst instincts, the best sadly submerged. Where was Bran? He crossed to the corner of the room. The small white pebble that was the wearstone lay just as it had lain before, <clears throat> innocuous and deadly. All around him, the force of the great king's will beat impeccably. Go away. Give up. You will not win. Give up. Go away. Will cast desperately about through the powers of his own mind to find out what might have happened to Bran and the dog, but found nothing. He thought miserably, you should never have left them here alone. In a kind of angry self-abasement, he leaned down once more and put his hand to the small round stone that he knew would be bound fast to the earth, beyond any ability of his to move it a fraction of an inch. And the wearstone came away as easily as any other stone, and lay loose in his palm, as if asking to be used. Will stared at it. He could not believe what he saw. What had lo loosed the grip of the wearstone? No magic he knew could do such a thing. It was a part of the law that the light could not budge a wearstone of the dark, nor the dark influence a wearstone of the light. That monstrous rig rigidity, rigidity once in force, could not be shattered by any but the, but the stone's owner. Who then could have broken the power of the wearstone of the Brennan and the Wid, other than the Brennan and the Wid himself, the Grey King? Will shook his head impatiently. He was wasting time. One thing was certain, at any rate. Left now without ownership, its control broken, the wearstone was outside the law and could, could itself be employed to tell him what had happened to bring it to its strange present state. Will kept close hold of the harp. He felt he would never put it down again, least of all in this place. But he stood in the center of the room with the wearstone lying in his open palm, and he said certain words in the old speech, and emptied his mind and waited to receive whatever kind of awareness the stone could put into it. The knowledge would not be simple and open. He knew. It never was. It came as he stood there with his eyes closed and his mind thrumming, in a series of images so rapid that they were like a narrative, a piece of a story. Will saw a man's face strong and handsome, but worn, with clear blue eyes and a gray beard. Though the clothes were strange and rich, he knew who it was within it in an instant. The face was that of the second lord in the cavern of Bird Rock, the lord in the sea blue robe, who had spoken with such particular, and then unaccountable, closeness to Bran. There was a deep sadness in the man's eyes. Will saw then the face of a woman, black haired and blue eyed, twisted in a dreadful mingling of grief and guilt, and somewhere with them he saw Merriman. Then he was seen in a different place, a low building with heavy stone walls, and across above its roof, a church, or an abbey. And from it, Merriman was leading the same woman with a baby in her arms. They stood in a high place on one of the old ways. There was a great whirling of mist rushing and a flurry of images so fast that Will could not follow nor make out more than a flash of the cottage. An upright, and an upright smiling Owen Davies with a younger unlined face and dogs and sheep and the mountain slopes green with Brocken and a voice calling, Gwenny, Gwenny. Then clearer than any, he saw Merriman hooded in the dark blue robe, standing with a black-haired woman up on the slope above the <clears throat> the Sini Valley, on Cadvin's way. She was weeping quietly, tears running slowly and glutting, glinting down her cheeks. She held nothing in her arms now. Merriman stretched out his hand, fingers st stiff straight, and Will heard through the whistle of the wind a thread of bell-like music that, as an old one following the ways of the old ones, he had heard before in other places and times. Then the whirling came again, and all was confusion. 
Though now he knew from the music that he was witnessing a traveling back to another age long ago, the movement through time that had held no difficulty for an old one or a lord of the dark, though impossible for men except in dreams. In a last flashing image, he saw the woman who had been with Merriman turn and go sadly back into the stone-built abbey and disappear behind its heavy walls. In a way alone elsewhere, yet superimposed on the abbey like the reflection of the glass that covers a picture, he saw the bearded face of the lord who had worn the blue sea robe, sea blue robe, with the gold circlet of a king crowning its head. And suddenly Will understood the true nature of Brand Davies, the child brought out of the past to grow up in the future. And he felt a terrible compassion for his friend, born to a fearsome destiny of which, as yet, he could have no clear idea at all. It was hard even to think about so astonishing a depth of power and responsibility. He saw now that he, Will Stanton, last of the old ones, had been fated all along to aid and support Bran in time to come, just as Merriman had always been at the side of Bran's great father, the father who had not known of his son's existence, back when he had been born and who only now, over the centuries, had as a lord of the high magic seen him for the first time. It was clear enough now how the ownership of the Warestone had been broken. Beside a figure of this mark, the power of the great king dwindled to its insignificance. But that was the only that was true only if Bran truly knew what he was doing, how much of his buried and infinitely power nature, powerful nature, had really been released. How much had he seen in the cottage? What images had spun into his own unsuspecting mind? Clutching the harp, forgetting his hurt arm in his haste, Will ran out of the cottage, clambered on the bicycle, and made off along the road to Tawile Inn. Bran could have gone no <laughs> nowhere else. All roads now must lead to the lake and to the sleepers. For at stake was not only the quest of the golden harp, the sleepers waking, but a power of the high magic that could, if still unrecognized and uncontrolled, destroy not only that quest, but the light as well. The Waking When Will came to tell Wylan, he knew he must try to keep out of sight. There was no way of telling where Caradoc Pritchard might be. Whether he had gone to Idris Jones's farm, where he would have turned from there, Will thought of going to the farm to check keeping hidden around the bend in the lane in case the battered gray van might be there. Then he changed his mind. There was too little time. Clutching his bundle, he rode on past the top of the tie bond lane and came to the corner where the road curved round the lake. Tawai Lin lay before him, rippled by the wind that all day he had, that had sent chunky, cumulus clouds scudding across the sky. Green with grass and brown with bracken, the mountains swept out and up from its shores at both sides. The dark lake filled the valley all the way to to the far end where the mountains met in a great V to make the pass of Tawai Lin. Will stared at the rippled water. Fire in the mountain shall find the harp of gold, played to the wake to wake the sleepers, oldest of the old. Where should it be played and when? Not here, out on the unprotected valley road. He turned left and rode toward the sides of the valley where, above the low gentle green fields, the first dark slope of Cater Idris climbed like a wall roofed by the sky. It was a slope on which he had found the dead sheep, the slope that its master, the gray King had shaken to throw Will down into the lake. Yet the instinct of the old ones drove to Will, drove Will to struggle towards it, to take, to make for the stronghold of the enemy, in a deliberate challenge to the furious force driving him back. The greater the odds, he thought, the greater the victory. There was a muted roaring in his ears as he rode with the bundled harp beneath his arm. Nearer and nearer, the mountainside loomed above him. Soon the road would curve away. To stay by the lake, he must dismount and climb over the fields and up the slope of treacherous loose scree to stand isolated overlooking the water, but he felt that was where he must go. Then swiftly, suddenly, Caradoc Pritchard stepped into the road in front of him and grabbed the handlebars of the bike, so that Will tumbled sideways into a painful heap on the ground. As he scrambled up, clutching the harp with an arm, now hurting still more, Will felt not anger or fear, but acute irritation. Pritchard, always Pritchard. While the great king loomed in dire threat of the light, Pritchard had a squealing mouse like a squealing mouse, must endlessly intrude to tug Will down to the petty rivalries and rages of ordinary men. He glared at Caradoc Pritchard with a mute disdain that the man had not the wit to recognize as being dangerous. Where are you going, English? said Pritchard, holding the bicycle firmly. His thinning red hair was disheveled. His small eyes glittered oddly. Will said, cold as winter fish, that has nothing whatsoever to do with you. Manners, manners, said Caradoc Pritchard. I know very well where you are going, my sweet young man. You and Bran Davies are trying to hide that other dang sheep, killing dog. There is not a single way in the world that you are going to keep me from him. What, what you got there, then, eh? His mindless suspicion, he reached for the sacking swathed bundle beneath Will's arm. Will's reaction was quicker even than his own eye could follow. 
The hawk was far, far too important to be placed in such foolish jeopardy. Instantly he was an old one, in the full blaze of power, rearing up terrible as a pillar of light. Towering in fury, he stretched an arm, pointing at Caradoc Pritchard, but met in answering rage a barrier of, barrier of furious resistance from the great king. At first Pritchard cringed before him, his eyes wide and his mouth slack with terror, expecting an annihilation. But as he found himself protected, slowly craftiness woke in his eyes. Will watched warily, warily, knowing that the bread in the wind was taking the greatest of all risks that any lord of the light or the dark could take, by channeling his own immense power through an ordinary mortal, who had not the slightest awareness of the appalling forces at his command. The lord of the dark must be in a desperate state to trust his cause to, to so perilous a servant. Leave me alone, Mr. Pritchard, Will said. I have not got John Rowland's dog with me. I don't even know where he is. Oh, yes, you do. You do know, boy, and so do I. Words tumbled out of Pritchard near the surface of his mind in the wonder at his new gift. He has been taken to Joan, Jones Tybont's farm to be kept for me so that he can get back to his murderous business again. But it will not work, indeed, no. No hope of it. I am not such a fool. He glared at Will, and you had better tell me where he is, boy. Tell me what you are all up to, or it will go very badly with you. Will could sense the man's anger and malice swirling round his mind like a maddened bird caught in a room without exit. Ah, burn in the wind, he thought with a kind of sadness. Your powers deserve better than to be put into <clears throat> one without discipline or training, without the wit to use them properly. He said, Mr. Pritchard, please leave me alone. You don't know what you are doing, really. I don't want to have to hurt you. Caradoc Pritchard stared at him for a moment of genuine blank wonder, like a man in the instant before he understands the point of a joke, and then he broke into gulping laughter. You don't want to hurt me? Well, that's very nice now. I'm delighted to hear it. Very thoughtful, very kind. The sunshine that had intermittently lit the morning was gone now. Gray cloud was thickening over the sky, sweeping down the valley and the wind that rippled the lake. Some instinct at the back of Will's mind made him suddenly aware of the grayness growing like a weight all around, and woke the decision that took hold of him as Caradoc Pritchard's jeering laughter spluttered down into control. He took a step or two backwards, holding the harp close at his side. Then, half closing his eyes, he called silently to the gifts that made him and the old one in full strength, to the spells that made him able to ride the wind, to fly beyond the sky and beneath the ski to the sea, to the circle of the light that had set him on this quest for the last link in their defense against the dark's rising. There was a sound like the murmuring sea out of the still lake Tawai Lin, Lin Wingil, and from the far edge of the dark water, a huge wave came traveling. It curled up high and white top, fringed with, its, with foam as if about to break, yet it did not break, but swept on across the water towards them, and on its curving peak rode six white swans, moving smooth as glass, their great wings outstretched and touching wingtip to wingtip. They were enormous, powerful birds, their white feathers shining like polished silver, even in the gray light of the cloud-hung sky. And as they drew near and near, one of the swans raised its head on the curving, graceful neck and gave a long, mournful cry, like a warning or a lament. On and on they came towards the shore, towards Will and Caradoc Pritchard. The wave loomed higher and higher, and a, gr a green wave, glowing with a strange translucent light that seemed to come out of the bottom of the lake. It was clear that the birds would dive upon them, and the wave break over them and rush forward down the valley, with all the water of the lake in one long rush, sweeping farms and houses and people before it in total devastation, down to the sea. Will knew this not to be true, but it was the image that he was forcing into Caradoc Pritchard's mind. The white swan gave one more whooping, mourning cry, with the shriek of a soul in utter emptiness, and Caradoc Pritchard stumbled backwards, his small eyes bulging in his head from horror and disbelief, one hand clutched in his, crutched in his red hair. He opened his mouth, and strange wordless sounds came out of it. Then something ceased, seemed to seize him, and he jerked into a frozen immobility. Arms and legs caught at unnatural angles, and the air was filled with a rushing, hissing sound that came so quickly its direction could not be told. But Will, appalled, knew what it must be. By accepting help from the dark, the Welshman had doomed his own mind. He saw in Caradoc Pritchard's eyes the quick flash of madness as human reason was swept aside by the dreadful power of the Grey King. He saw the mind sway as the body was, still unwittingly possessed. Pritchard's back straightened. His pudgy form seemed to rise taller than before, and the shoulders hunched themselves in a hint of immense strength. The force of the Brun in the Wind's magic was in him and pulsing out of him, and he stared at the advancing wave and shrieked in a cracked voice some words of Welsh. As the swans rose crying into the air and curved away on long, slow-beating wings, for all at once the rearing wave collapsed, dragged down into heaviness by a tremendous churning and heaving of a thousand upon thousand fish, 
silver and gray and dark glint and green, they boiled on the surface, perch and trout and wriggling eels, and slant mouths pike with needle teeth and small eel eyes. It was as if all the fish and all the lakes of whales seethed, seethed, seethed there in a huge mass on the water of Lynn Wingill, smoothing its surface into a quivering stillness. Yet it was with the use of a voice and a mind no more than, a, than human that so great a spell had been cast. A chill struck into Will as he understood his, this new deviousness of the Brennan the Wind. There would be no open confrontation. He himself would never see the Grey King again. For in such a facing of two poles of enchantment, there was, a danger, there was danger of annihilation for one. Instead, Will would face, as he was facing now, the power of the Grey King channeled through the mind of an evil-wishing but innocent man, a man made into a dreadfully vulnerable vessel for the dark. If the light were to give any final annihilating stroke in this encounter, the dark would be would still be protected, but the mind of the man would inevitably be destroyed. Caradoc Pritchard, if he were still sane now, would be driven then forever into hopeless madness. Unless Will could somehow avoid such an encounter, there was no help for it. The Great King was using Pritchard as a shield, knowing that he himself could remain protected if the shield were destroyed. Will called out in anguish, hardly knowing he did so. Caradoc Pritchard, stop. Leave us alone. For your own sake, leave me alone. But there was nothing he could do. The momentum of their conflict was already too great, like a wheel spinning faster and faster downhill. Caradoc Pritchard was gazing in childish delight at the lake of seething fish, rubbing his hands together, talking steadily to himself in Welsh. He looked at Will and giggled. He did not stop talking, but switched to English, the words coming out in a half-crazed conversational stream, very fast. You see the pretty creatures now, so many thousands of them at all hours and doing what we ask. More of a match for six swans than you were expecting, eh, De Winbach? And you do not know what you are up against. Enough nonsense we have had now, my friends and me. It is time that you are going to show me the dog. The dog. Because anything you do to try and turn us aside will be no use at all. No use at all. So I want the dog now, English. You are, going, you are to tell me where I can find the dog. And my good gun is there in the car waiting for him, and there will be no more sheep killing in this valley. I shall see to that. He was watching Will, the little eyes darting up and down like small fish themselves, and suddenly once more his gaze fastened on the sacking bundled harp. But first I would like to know what that really is under your arm there, boy. So I think you should you will show me that if you would like us to leave you alone. He giggled again on the last word, and Will knew that there was no hope now of reaching the side of the mountain, the place from which it would have been safest and most fitting to play the golden harp. He stepped slowly backwards in a smooth movement designed to keep Caradoc Pritchard from alarm, and as caution woke too late in the farmer's bright eyes, he slipped the harp out from its covering, laid it crooked in one, of, one arm as he had seen Brand do, and swept the fingers of the other hand over its strings, and so the world changed. Already now the sky was a heavier gray than it had been as the afternoon darkened toward evening and the clouds thickened for rain. But as the lilting flow of notes from the little harp poured out into the air, in an aching sweetness, a strange glow seemed very subtly to begin shining out of the lake and cloud and sky, mountain and valley, bracken and grass. Colors grew brighter, dark places more intense and secret. Every sight and feeling was more vivid and pronounced. The fish covering the whole swaying surface of the lake began to change. Flickering silver, fish after fish, leapt into the air and curved down again until the lake seemed no longer burdened with a great weight of sluggish creatures, but alive and dancing with bright streaks of silver light. And out of the sky, at the seaward end of the valley, down towards the lake, another sound rose over the sweet, arpeggious lilting to and fro as Will ran his fingers gently up and down the strings of his harp. There was a harsh cry, like the calling of seagulls, and flying in groups and pairs, without formation, came swooping the strange, ellip ellipsoid black forms of cormorants, twenty or thirty of them, more than Will had ever seen flying together. The kings of the bird bird fishermen of the sea, never for normally seen, seen away from sea, and its cliffs and crags, they came skimming down to the surface of the Lynn Wingville and began snatching up the leaping fish, and Will remembered suddenly brand stories of how the bird rock, Craig Irdian, is the only place in the world where cormorants are known to gather and build their nests inland, because in the land of the Great King, the coast has no rocky cliffs for such building, but only sand and beaches and dunes. Down they swept. The fish jumped, sparkling. Cormorants gulped them, gulped them, swerved away, dived, and gulped again. Caradoc Pritchard gave a cross wail like a disappointed child. 
The curious light glimmered through the valley. Still, Will's fingers flickered over the harp, and the music rumbled out, deliberate and clear as spring water. He was caught up in a tension that prickled through him like electricity, a fierce anticipation of unknown wonders. He felt as taut as though every hair stood on end, and then, all at once, the fish vanished. The surface of the lake was suddenly smooth as dark glass, and all the cormorants swept towards upwards in a cloud and curved away, shrieking, disappearing back up the log rod valley to burn rock. And through the luminescence that held the valley suspended in daylight, moonlight, or moonlit half-light, Will saw six figures take shape. They were horsemen riding. They came out of the mountain, out of the lowest slopes of Cater Idris that reached up from the lake into the fortress of the Great King. They were silvery gray, glinting figures riding horses of the same strange half color, and they rode over the lake without touching the water, without making any sound. The music of the harp lapped them round, and as they drew near, Will saw that they were smiling. They wore tunics and cloaks. Each one had a sword hanging at his side. Two were hooded. One wore a circlet about his head, a gleaming circlet of nobility, though not the crown of a king. He turned to Will as though the ghostly, ghostly group rode by and he bent his smiling bearded head in greeting. The music rippled bell-like round the valley from the harp in Will's hands, and Will bent his own head in sober greeting, but did not break his plane. The riders rode past, Caradoc Pritchard, who stood gaping vacantly at the lake, looking for the vanished wondrous fish, and clearly, clearly did not see anything else. He has the power of the great king, Will thought, but not the eyes. Then the riders wheeled back suddenly towards the slope of the mountain, and Will, and before Will could wonder why at it, he saw that Rand stood there on the slope, halfway up the loose scree, near the ledge that had broken his own fall earlier that day. The black sheep dog Pen was beside him, and toiling up the slope after them was Owen Davies, bent and weary with the same blankness in his face that Caradoc Pritchard wore. It was not for ordinary men to see that the sleepers, woken out of their long centuries of rest, were riding now to the rescue of the world from the rising dark. But Rand could see. He stood watching the sleepers with a blaze of delight in his pale face. He raised one hand to Will and opened both arms in a gesture of ad admiration at the playing of the harp. For a moment, he seemed no more than an uncomplicated small boy caught up in a bubbling wonder of marvelous sight, but only for a moment. The six riders, glinting silvery gray on their silver gray mounts, curved round after their leader and paused for a moment in a line before the place in the hillside where Brand stood. Each drew a sword and held it upright before his face in a salute, and kissed the flat of its blade in homage as to a king. And Bran stood there slimly erect as a young tree, his white hair gleaming in a silver crest, and bent his head gravely to them with the quiet arrogance of a king granting a boon. Then they sheathed their swords again and wheeled about, and the silver gray horses sprang up into the sky, and the sleepers, wakened and riding, rose high over the lake and away, disappearing fur further and further into the gathering gloom of the Tao Wai Lin, past and beyond, until they were gone from the valley and beyond, and could be seen no more. Will stilled his fingers on the golden harp, and its delicate melody, melody died, leaving only the whisper of the wind. He felt drained as though all the strength had gone out of him. For the first time, he remembered that he was not only an old one, but also... <clears throat> a convalescent, still weak from the long illness that in the beginning had sent him to Wales. For a flicker of an instant, too, he then, then he remembered what John Rollins had said about the coldness at the heart of the light, as he realized by what agency he, he must have been become so suddenly and severely ill. But it was only for an instant. To an old one, such things were not of importance. All at once he was brushed aside, and a hasty rough hand stretched, snatched the golden heart from his grasp. The power of the great king seemed gone from Caradoc Pritchard, but he was not what he had been before it had come. So that is what it's all about, then, Pritchard said thickly. A bloody harp, a little gold thing, just like she was playing. Give it back, Will said. Then he paused. She? It is a Welsh harp, English. An old one. Pritchard peered owishly at it. What might, what might it be doing in your hands? You have no right to be holding a Welsh harp. Suddenly he was glaring viciously at Will. Go home. Go back where you belong. Mind your business. Will said, the harp has fulfilled its purpose. What did you mean? Like she was playing. Mind your business, Pritchard said again savagely. A long time ago and nothing to do with you. From the corner of his eye, Will could see that Owen Davies had joined Bran up on the hillside and with Penn darting restlessly between them. Desperately, he tried to will Bran to move away out of sight. He could not understand why he stayed there in the open. Or a casual glance would show them to Caradoc Pritchard. Move, he shouted silently. Go away. But it was too late. Something, perhaps the sheepdog's anxious wheeling, had caught Pritchard's eye. He glanced 
half co consciously up at the mountain, and he froze. Every part of the moment seared itself into Will's brain, so that ever afterwards he could feel the quick roaring of an impending disaster and see a bright picture, the heavy gray sky, the rearing mountain, the rippling dark lake, the startling patches of color made by a white-haired boy and a man with flaring red hair, and over it all the strange glow of a light like the warming lumin luminous, <coughs> luminous hanging over a uh, countryside before a dreadful storm. Caradoc Pritchard turned towards him, a face marked with a terrible mingling of anger, reproach, and pain, and at the heart of them all a thin core of hatred and the urge to hurt back. Looking deliberately into Will's face, he heaved back his arm and flung the golden harp far out into the lake. Ripples circled outward on the dark water and then were still. Then Pritchard ran, light as a boy, throwing himself forward to the mountain and to Bran standing there like a figurehead with the dog pen. At the last moment before the slope, he turned aside along the curving road that led back down the valley, and Will saw that he had left the small gray van there in the road and was running towards it now with a desperate speed. In the same moment, he realized why and flung a great spell of prevention at Pritchard, only to have it cast aside by the protection of the great king that the farmer, unknowing, still carried with him. Caradog Pritchard reached the van, snatched open its back doors, and brought out his long-muzzled shotgun, the same gun with which he had shot. Brand's dog could fall. Swiftly, he cocked the gun, swung around, and began walking deliberately and steadily toward the boy and the dog on the hill. He had no need for haste now. There was no cover to which they could run. Will dug his fingernails into his palms, his mind thrashing for an effective defense. Then he heard the sound of a noisy car. The Land Rover swung at an astonishing speed out of the lane from Tybon Farm and around the corner to the lake. John Rollins must have seen Pritchard and his van and his gun all in one appalled moment, for the chunky little car rushed forward to a jerking halt almost at the farmer's feet. The door seemed hardly open before John Rowland's lanky form was out. He stood still, facing Caradog Pritchard and the boy and the dog all on, on the hillside beyond. Caradog, he said, there is no sheep here with its throat cut. You have no right and no need. Pritchard's voice was high and dangerous. There is a sheep dead up there now, and Will saw that the body of the ewe attacked by the milgren, still up, up there on its ledge, was visible as a white heap from where they stood. He knew then, for the first time, why the great king had made sure that the, his milgwen should bring it to that spot. That is a pentriff sheep from those wintering at Clwyd, John Rowland said. Oh, very likely, said Pritchard, sneering. I will show you. Come up and see. Even if it were, what of that? It is still that murdering dog of yours that does these things. To sheep in your own care, too, is it? What is the matter with you, Rowlands, that you keep him? His face glistening with the sweat of rage, Pritchard brought up his gun level <clears throat> with his waist facing the hill. No, John Rowan said behind him, his voice very deep. deep. Something in Caradoc Pritchard cracked and he swung around to face Rowan's, the gun still pointing. His voice pitched itself higher still. He was like a wire about to break. Always pushing your nose in, you are, John Rowan's. Trying to stop me now the way you stopped me before. You should not have stopped me then. I would have fought him harder and won, and then she would have come with me. She would have come with me, if it had not been for you pushing in. His hands were white where they clenched the gun. His words came out so fast they fell over themselves. John Rowland stood speechless, staring at him, and Will saw, understanding gradually, follow astonishment on the tough kind of face as he realized that Pritchard, what Pritchard was talking about. But before he could speak, Owen Davies' voice came unexpectedly strong and clear from the hillside above them, like a bell ringing out. Oh, no, indeed. She would not have come with you, Caradog. Never. And you were not winning that fight, and you never... You would never have won in a hundred years, and it was lucky for you that John Rollins did break into it. I did not know what I was doing, but I would have killed you if I could, for hurting my Gwen. Your Gwen? Pritchard spat the words. Any man's Gwen. That was as clear as the light in the sky. Why else would she choose a man like you, Owen Davies? A lovely wild thing out of the mountains she was, with a face like a flower and fingers that made music out of that little heart that she cared like no music you ever knew before. For an instant, there was a terrible yearning in his voice, but almost as soon again, he tort the, the torture, half-crazed face, twisted back into malevolence, and he looked at Bran's white head. And the bastard son there, that you kept all these years to torment me, to remind me. You had no right to him, either. I could have looked after her and her child better than you. Bran said in a high, remote voice that seemed to come so far out of the past that it, that it put a chill into Will's spine. And would you then have shot my dog to fall, Mr. Pritchard? Not even your dog. That animal was not, Pritchard said roughly. That was a working dog of your father's. Oh, yes, said Brandon in the same clear, distant voice. 
Yes, indeed, my father had a dog named Kafal. Will's blood tingled in his veins, for he knew that the Kafal of whom Bran spoke was not the dog Kafal who had been shot, and the father not Owen Davies. So now Bran, the pen dragon, must know of his true, <clears throat> magnificent, dreadful heritage. Then a last sudden astonishment woke in Will's mind. It must have been Owen Davies who gave the dead dog his name, for Bran had said that Kafal had to come had come to them when he himself was only a very small boy. Why had Owen Davies named his son's dog by the name of the great king's hound? His eyes flickered to Owen Davies' thin, unproposing, prepossessing form, and he saw that the man was watching him. Oh, yes, Davies said, I knew. I tried not to believe it. But I've always known. She came from Cater, Cater Indris, you see, and that is the seat of Arthur in English. With Arthur, Arthur's son, she came out of the past because she had betrayed the king, her lord, and was afraid that he would cast out his own son as a result. By enchantment of the Duin, she brought the boy into the future, away from their troubles, the future that is the present time now for us. And she left him here, and perhaps, perhaps she would not herself ha have had to go back into the past if the fat fool there had not interfered, interfered and heard the harp and wanted my Guinevere <coughs> and tried to take her away. He looked coldly down at the Caradog Pritchard. With a snarl, snarl of fury, Pritchard jerked his gun up to his shoulder, but John Rowan swiftly reached out a long arm and wrenched it from him before his finger could reach the trigger. Pritchard shouted angrily, gave him a great push, and leapt away, scrambling up in venomous fury towards the ledge where Bran and Owen Davies stood. Bran went to Davies and put his arm around his waist and stood close. It was the first gesture of affection between the two that Will had ever seen. And wondering, loving surprise woke in Owen Davies' worn face as he looked down at the boy's white head, and the two stood there, waiting. Pritchard scrambled, scrambled towards them, murder in his eyes, but John Rollins was close behind him. He swung the gun at Pritchard like a stick, knocking him sideways, and then seized him, seized and held him with the force of a much younger man. Wildly struggling, but grasped into helplessness, Caradog Pritchard put back his head and gave a terrible shriek of madness. As all control from the dark left him, and his mind collapsed into the wreck, it must now remain. And with the sleepers ridden, and the last hope of harming Bran gone, the Grey King gave up his battle. The echoes of Pritchard's shriek became a long, howling cry through the mountains, rising, falling, rising, echoing from peak to peak, as all the powers of the dark vanished forever from Cater Idris, from the valley of the <coughs> Dizini, from Tawai Lin, cold as death, anguished, as all the loss in the world. It died away and yet still seemed to hang in the air. They stood, motionless, caught in horror. And the mist that men called the breath of the Grey King came creeping down out of the pass and down the side of the mountains, rolling and curling and wisping, concealing all it reached, until at last it cut off every one of them from the rest. Until at the last it cut off every one of them from the rest. A rustling, flurry, flurrying sound came out of the mist, but only Will saw the Grey Great gray forms of the ghost foxes, the Milgwin and the Brendan Wood, come rushing headlong down the mountain and plunge into the dark lake and disappear. Then the mist closed over Lin Min, Min Gwil, the lake in the pleasant retreat, and there was a cold silence through all the valley, save for the distant bleat, sometimes, of a mountain sheep, like the echo of a man's voice calling a girl's name far away. Here ends the Great King. The next book in the dark is rising. S sequence is silver on the tree.